he was... D- <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter number 4. And I want to share with you this morning the focus of faith. The focus of faith. Romans chapter 4. And we'll begin reading in verse number 17. We're really just jumping into the text. If you have an opportunity later on, you might want to go back and read the whole chapter, but Romans 4, beginning in verse number 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before whom, before him who he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, God had promised, God was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but notice, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to once again gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to worship you. Lord, help us to really understand a little bit more clearly uh, what that means, that when the church assembles and and we meet to honor Christ and meet with Christ. We pray, God, that you'd help us to have a greater sense of your work and your wonder. And, and help us, Lord, teach us that we might worship you in a way that you would bring, uh, that you would be glorified and honored. We pray, Father, this morning that the word of God that's preached would work uh, effectually in the heart of everyone that hears we pray, God, that there would be a greater sense of uh, understanding and more clarity about the exercising of their faith. Lord, I pray there would be a growth in their faith, a strengthening. Uh, Lord, that individuals who may be weak in faith this morning might be strengthened to become even stronger uh, in their confidence and uh, trust in you. We pray, God, that you would help us. We realize that without the Holy Spirit of God working in our hearts this morning. Nothing will be accomplished. And so we pray earnestly for the assistance and aid and work of the Spirit of God. Holy Ghost, breathe on those that are here. Help them to hear the Word of God. Help them to accept the Word of God, to believe it, and to apply it to their life. And Father, we'll give you glory for what you do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Today we need to take a closer look at the faith of Abraham, especially looking at uh, the focus of that faith. How was Abraham such a father of faith? Such a, a testimony of what it means to live a life of faith. Remember, as we read, it wasn't just written for Abraham's sake, it's for us. So we can read these passages together And so our faith would be increased and we could know how that we can live out our Christian life. In Hebrews chapter 11, we have a long list of men and women of faith. They believed God. They trusted in God. But most of those individuals only have a single verse that talks about their faith. Have you ever noticed that when you go through the heroes of faith? Sometimes there's just one verse talking about this Man or this woman's faith in God. For example, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says this about Noah's amazing faith, his great faith. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, 
by the which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And that's all that's said about Noah's faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And some didn't even get a full verse, right? Uh, he's getting to the conclusion of his point about faith, and he says this in verse 32, And what shall I say more? Or what shall I more say? For a time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of... And he lists them. Just mention their name. Samson's faith. David's faith. Just a little phrase that said, I want to remind you of these Men of faith. But when he talks about Abraham, he uses 12 verses in the Heroes of Faith. He spends quite a bit of time focusing in on Abraham's faith. Go back, if you have an opportunity, and read those 12 verses. Take a closer look and look uh, at what the writer of Hebrews has to say about Abraham, his faith, and Sarah's faith faith and I'm sure it will be a benefit and blessing to you and so I want to just remind you of how often the Bible says look at this man and his faith and I want you to maybe understand and grow in your, uh, your own faith by seeing what Abraham saw looking at what Abraham looked at now first of all let me mention this the atheists of our day are trying to redefine faith and their effort to redefine faith, they're saying to you that your confidence in God, your belief in God, your trust in God is really just foolishness. There's no there there. And so they mock faith. They laugh at faith. They say it's a belief in something that has no fact or no reality. That is their redefining of faith and even belief. And while they ridicule faith, they exercise faith. <laughs> and when you point out the fact that, hey, you, you have faith, you have faith in your wife that she's going to be faithful to you and keep those uh, vows that you made on your wedding day, and so you have faith in your wife, you have faith in your doctor that he's telling you the right thing. You don't go back and say, hey, now wait a minute. I want to get a scientific proof that my doctor is telling me. He said, take this pill or you need this surgery. And you say, okay, cut away. Because you're saying, that doctor wouldn't lie to me. Oh, no, no doctor would lie to you ever, would he? <laughs> you have faith in the mechanic, Right? He said, look, that engine's cracked and the whole thing has to be replaced and you don't, you don't have a clue. You may have some mechanical skills and say, well, it's kind of given the evidence of that, but it might just be a cracked head gasket. <laughs> you know? It's not as severe, but he tells you that and you have faith and so you point out, hey, atheist, you have faith. And they say, well, that's not faith. The reason they have to do that is because they don't believe that God is. And just like you can have faith in a doctor and faith in your wife or faith in the mechanic, we can have faith in God because God is trustworthy. He is true. His character is without question. Amen? <laughs> Whatever He says is good and right. There is a God and we can trust everything God said. And so don't let the world tell you that your faith is foolishness. We're trusting in someone whose character is concrete. Amen? In a God the Bible declares who cannot lie. And so let's look at Abraham's faith here in Romans chapter number 4. Notice what he did not focus on. Abraham did not focus on the problems Look at verse number 19 again, if you would, in Romans chapter number 4. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, and he continues, and he did not consider, consider either the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham didn't think about his own body and the fact that Sarah could not even bear children that did not even come in the equation at all. 
He did not look at those things. He looked at the promise God gave. And that's what I want to try to encourage you to do again this morning. You can always find things that oppose your faith. There's always a question. There's always something that would say the opposite of that is true. But we don't need to focus in on the problems. We need to focus in on the promises that God has given to us. Notice he did not focus on his physical limitations. He was almost a hundred years old. Think about that. Almost a hundred years old and you said, Abraham, are you going to have a, a son? Yes. Absolutely. Abraham, that was something to that. You're almost a hundred years old. How can you say, yes, absolutely? And the only way he could respond to that is say, well, God said I would. And I know in the ears of the world that sounds insane, that in the ears of the world. But with men and women who know God, that is the most firm statement. That sounds absolutely right. You can trust God no matter what the circumstances are. Amen? He didn't look at his physical limitations. Look at Sarah. She was nearing the age of 90. You know, there's a certain stage in life where women reach and they're no longer able to bear children. And Abraham is saying, and the Bible is saying, she's past that time. She she can't physically of her own ability bear children. I did just a little search on the internet. I, said, I wondered what was the oldest lady that ever had a child and I found out that she was 70 years old. And they did the uh, fertilize, uh, fertilize the egg and, and she had twins at the age of 70 and her husband 77. But she didn't get that way naturally, right? She had to do something that was not natural in order to have, and, and they were from India and they didn't have a son and they desperately wanted a son and so at the age of 70 she had twins, one boy and one girl. And here is Abraham and Sarah and it's impossible. They've reached the point of impossibility. There's no shot whatsoever, no chance to have children. Abraham, are you going to have a son? Yes, absolutely, I'm going to have a son. Neither did he consider, I know this is close to it, but the passing of time. The reason I want to add that is because this is what happens to our faith. When a month goes by, our faith gets a little weaker. When a year goes by, our faith gets even Weaker. When ten years goes by, our faith gets even weaker. And the longer time goes, the weaker our faith gets, right? You say, but when is God going to do that? He hasn't done it for these number of years. And that's what and that's going on even in our day, isn't it? When is Christ going to come? We've been hearing that forever. Well, guess what? We're another Sunday closer. Amen? <laughs> He's coming. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because he said so. And he can't lie. Amen? Amen? Every day that cooks off the calendar, we know, we know, we're one day closer to our Lord's coming. Isn't that true? But Abraham's faith did not grow weak because of the passing of time. It may have took longer than what he anticipated, but he said, listen, I have all the confidence in God that God is going to keep his word. Neither did he consider prior history. That is, nobody else was having babies at the age of 100. All right? And he, he didn't he'd sit down and say, wait a minute, uh, you know, God said this, but I don't know if anybody that's having children at the age of a hundred. Maybe I should reconsider this thing. Maybe I heard God wrong. 
You know, they they and they did say, well, let's, let's maybe God intended for Hagar. Maybe she's the one. And then God had to come back and strengthen that faith and say, no, you you and Sarah are going to have a child. Didn't consider prior history. If you lined up the best doctors of even Abraham's day, right? And Abraham said, Doc, I'm going to have a son. He'd say, Abraham, you're, you, I think you're going a little bit senile up there. That's impossible. The longer time goes by, the more our physical bodies are limited. What other people say often, what does that do to us? It weakens our faith, doesn't it? But Abraham was not focused on the age of his body or the passing of time or what everybody else was experiencing. That was not the focus. The focus wasn't on the problem. The focus of Abraham was on the promise God gave him. And that's what I want to try to encourage you again this morning. It's not on the, all the no's and the negative. What you need to focus on once again is what did God say? What did he promise? What did he reveal to me to be true? And I can stand on that when the world is falling apart. I can stand firmly on that foundation, can't you? His focus was on the promise of God. Notice verse 18 according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And that's what he held on to. He heard God say, this is going to take place. And I'm quoting God, Abraham would say. Look again at verse number 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He did not waver. You know, what, what we do a lot of times is we uh, get a sheet of paper, right? And we write on one side the pros, and the other side we write the cons, you know? And then we try to make a decision if one outweighs the other. Isn't that how we normally do it? Can you envision Abraham as a piece of paper? And on this side, he's writing all the reasons he's never going to have a child. And the list is long. And on the other side, he just has one little statement. God promised. Isn't that true? And he didn't waver. You know what? That, that indicates he didn't even get this, a sheet of paper out and said, hey, let me go back and re look at this again. Maybe I misunderstood. Maybe I was wrong. He didn't have no internal argument internal discussion. He wasn't debating and struggling. Is this true? Is it not? Is it true? Is it not? Did I hear God or did I not hear God? There was none of that going on. He knew. He knew. He knew what God said. And so no matter what happened in his life, with all the confidence in the world, he knew that God was going to keep his word. Amen? And that's the kind of faith that God wants you and I to have. Verse 21 says, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, that is God, he was able also to perform it. Amen? So I want, to, I want you to think this morning about some of the difficulties. How, how much faith did Abraham have in this? Well, he had the child, and then God said, Now I want you to take that child up on Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. And what did Abraham do? He went straight up that mountain, laid that boy on the altar, and put the knife back. And God said, no, don't take his life. I've got a ram for you. I will provide a lamb as a sacrifice. And you read Hebrews. What did the writer of Hebrews say about that? He said, fully persuaded that if he had taken his life, that God would raise that son back up from the dead. That's an amazing faith. That's worth 12 verses in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, isn't it? And that's the kind of faith God wants you to have. It's the kind of faith that He expects you to have. It's the kind of life that He wants you to live. Don't listen to the lies of the world. Listen to the truth of what God has said in His Word. 
Think about some of the areas that we face. God's supply. God promised to meet our needs, didn't He? How many say amen to that? As God promised to meet all of our needs, we know not our wants, but certainly every need we have. We have a God in heaven that said, I will guarantee you that I, I will meet all of your needs. I promise you that. Amen? Didn't he say that? And I can't say it more emphatically than when I said it there. Amen? Now, does God have a track record of being true to His Word? And Brother Owen, has God always supplied your needs? Amen. But Tim, has God always met your needs? For for y'all who can't hear a head nod, that was a yes right there. (laughs) Yes. And I can go all over the building to every believer and say, tell me about your life. Tell me about your needs. Tell me about the time that there was a want. Did God show up? And you'd say, yes, time and time and time and time again, our God showed up and He'd done amazing things to meet our needs. Our church can testify to this. We purchased this building. There was nice carpet in here, but it had been in here for quite some time and it was getting really dirty looking. And so we started praying about it. Money wasn't in the bank. We started praying about it. God, we really need to replace this carpet. It just looks bad. And it wasn't long until a friend of mine called and said, hey, we have a project every year where we try to help churches, mission churches and works. And he said, our church has taken in a large offering and we want to send you all a certain amount of money And that money covered all the carpet that we needed in this building. Every bit of it. And friends, that's not the only time God has met our needs. (laughs) And it's not just with carpet and with air conditioning and with vehicles. God has done amazingly. He has sent people our way. When we sometimes have been at the point of discouragement, He would send a friend, a Navy couple, somebody here to just lift up and help and edify the church and sometimes we're discouraged and sometimes we're defeated but God says listen look back on my track record I've always met every need you had and we can say amen to that amen what did he say in Philippians 4 and verse 19 my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus remember Psalms 23 Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Matthew chapter number 6, take no thought for tomorrow. (laughs) What you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal shall you be clothed. The unsaved world looks at, they worry about that, they work for that, they long for that. Don't you worry about a single thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. God said, listen, if I take care of the flowers in the field and make sure they're adorned right, I'm going to put some clothes on your back. I'm going to put shoes on your feet. Amen? If I would feed the birds that have no value at all, Why would you not think that I would care for you and feed you and take care of you? Does he not supply our every need? He is faithful to do that. Amen? But not only just in our supply, but also in our suffering. Also in our suffering. If you list the pros and cons about suffering, I promise you this, on the side where you don't want to suffer is a long list. Amen? I don't think any of us would write anything positive on that side of suffering. I'm in pain. I I hurt all the time. I cry at night. I can't sleep. I'm sick. I'm troubled. I have a heart problem. And there's just a long list of suffering. And then on the other side, there's a single phrase. God will meet your needs. Amen? 
And, and Christian, a lot of times, that's all you have. I don't know if you've ever been in a time of great, great, great suffering. But sometimes that's all you have in a, in a time of tremendous suffering is the simple confidence that even in this most darkest hour of my life, God is with me and He will care for me and carry me through. He will not leave me during my time of suffering. I'm afraid sometimes since I've preached to you so often that when I give my personal testimony, you probably go kind of silent on that. But I was working late one night, May the 2nd, 1996, and a young lady ran a stop sign, hit the vehicle I was in, flipped it three or four times, and I hit a large oak tree and it threw me out of the vehicle. It broke my leg on my right side, almost up at my hip, a high break on that leg. I had to put a rod in. It broke my back. L3, 4, and 5. L3 and 5 were fractured. L4 was a burst fracture. It was just gone. And the doctor said, that's bad. He said, well, it was better than it crushing and cutting your spinal cord in two. It was better that it bursted than severed your spinal cord. Thank God for a burst fracture. Amen? <laughs> and I don't know how many nights at 2 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock I would call my wife and I'd say, Honey, I need you to have prayer with me. And I'd call my pastor and say, Preacher, pray with me because it was a dark night. It was a hard night. It was a lonely night. But God saw me through. And never turned His back on me. Loved me. Cared for me. When I didn't know if I'd walk again. I didn't know how I would ever work again. I didn't know what I was going to face in life. And some of you have been there. And I want you to know, I've been there, and I want you to know something. There, I found God faithful. Even in suffering, He's faithful. That's why James can write, and it sounds strange to us, and it confuses us, right? They're like, huh? Joy and suffering should not be in the same verse. Right? And yet we read over and over again and we find them there, paired together. And if you've never been there, if you've never had the Lord lift you up, you don't know how He works. So I was thinking about this sermon. I thought how they purify silver and they purify gold. And what, and what does that silver and that gold do when they're being purified? They just rest in the flame. There's nothing else they can do, is it? They just let the flame burn out the dross. And you say, well, I've been in the fire a long time, and evidently there's still some more dross there that God has to get out. There's a purpose. It's, it's not that it's not planned or oversaw. God is sovereign. He's involved. Amen? And I take great comfort in the fact that God is aware, and He's with me, and He'll help me. In James 1, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations or trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's that joyful endurance. That is, no matter how hard he heated the battle, I still sing, Hallelujah, God's with me. Hey, Amen, the Lord is here. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing 1 Peter 4 12 and 13 beloved think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you but rejoice insomuch as you're partakers of Christ the sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You see what happens is we focus here on the here and now and the difficulties of the day and God is looking at us and He is seeing faithfulness and, and commitment and loyalty and 
in His kingdom, He's going to re reward you. And He is noticed, noticed as the King of kings and He reigns. He's going to, boy, what a joyful day that is that I have served this Christ and this Savior. Amen? And even in our serving. In our day, this is especially true. And serving seems to be sometimes for nothing. Right? Isn't that true? You, have, you who have served, you know, you, you uh, and I don't want to sing out the... Uh, uh, the bus kids, because often they do really well. But sometimes you'll go and pick them up at night, and, and they're all really loud, and they're fighting, and they're saying words they shouldn't say. And you bring them to the church, and then the teachers try to get them, and the teachers bounce, say, how do they do? And they, oh, they cause trouble the whole night long, and you take them back, and and you have to talk to their parents and you get in the vehicle and you're driving home and you think, this is insane! <laughs> right? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> I don't have to do this! And then one of those children come to Christ and they're saved. And they grow up to live for God. And you say, well, you know what? It was worth everything. You say, preacher, wouldn't it be wonderful if all of them got saved and all of them lived for God? Absolutely. That's the great desire of our heart. And it may be that God would take the seed that we planted and do something wonderful in their life later on. I don't know. <laughs> but I can promise you this, God is faithful to reward His servants. Amen? Many times we look at the problems if we were to make a list about serving, <laughs> pros and cons, serving, my wife says over and over again, it almost troubles the children because they, she says always, serving requires sacrifice. And we'll get to be doing something, she'll say, serving requires sacrifice. And, we'll, and I, we know, Mom, serving requires sacrifice. And when you're sacrificing and you're expending yourself and you're laboring and you're giving and it seems like there's nothing and no fruit, you say, what's the purpose of it all anyway? You're forgetting. God rewards faithful servants. Amen? Amen. He does. We're going through the book of Jeremiah at, on Sunday, uh, Wednesday night. And it's not an a exciting book in the sense that there's judgment, there's wrath, there's God having to punish His people because they refuse to listen. And here's a lonely, lonely prophet crying out and begging the people to turn and nobody's listening to a word he said. And yet he still pours out his heart and warns the people. Why? Why would anybody do that? Because it's an honorable thing to serve the Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen? If you're, listen, if you're serving just because of what you get out of it, you'll be out of serving in a short period of time. Amen? But if you're serving for Christ, you can serve Christ no matter what goes on in the world. Amen? And when you look at his, the focus of Abraham's faith is not just in the promises so much in the words that are spoken. It's in the one who spoke the word. His faith is in the God of heaven. Amen? And he knows this God is faithful and true and trustworthy and he'll do exactly what he said he would do. And you can trust that to be true in your life also. There's no telling what God will do if we'll be faithful. We know what he'll do if we're unfaithful, right? We saw that this morning in Sunday school. <laughs> I, would, I would to God we could read Numbers 13 and 14 and hear about they came back and ten of them said, we, there, listen, there's, it's just too much trouble to cross over this Jordan. And the crowd said, be quiet! God is with us! We're going over! That would have been a great 
great verses to read, wouldn't it? Amen? But they didn't believe, and God turned them back in the wilderness, and they died in the wilderness. The next generation got the victory. Amen? <laughs> They, they they experienced the power of God. They watched the walls of Jericho fall. They conquered the enemies. They marched forward. They conquered the land. That's what abiding faith can do. Anybody can throw in the towel. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. Quit, amen? Isn't that true? Easiest thing in the world is quit. But who can quit serving such a wonderful Savior? We're forgetting about the rewards that are awaiting. We look at our bank account here and we forget about the fact that there's a bank account in the kingdom of heaven. We look at the land we possess here and we're forgetting about the promise of the land that we'll have over there. We look at the loss that we have here. Sometimes family and friends, they turn their backs on us. But Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 19, listen, I'll multiply those family and friends a hundredfold in the kingdom that is coming. See, If you just live for the here and now, you'll miss it. But if you labor faithfully for Christ and His kingdom, you'll be rewarded greatly by Christ. If you're here this morning, you're unsaved. Believe what Christ said. Amen? Amen. He said, if you don't, in John chapter 8, if you don't believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe what Christ did. Believe what Christ said. Believe what He promised. Put your faith and trust in Him, and you can have eternal life. But you cannot have salvation without faith, trust, and belief. Amen? You can't. And by the way, you can't live much of a Christian life without it either. And what you need to do is stop looking at all the problems and the difficulties and what the naysayers say and even what your flesh wants to bring up as arguments against faith. How many face that battle? Remind yourself again, no, wait a minute, what did God say? God promised to meet my needs. God promised that there was a purpose in suffering. Amen? He promised He would reward faithful service. I love that passage in Hebrews chapter number 6 in verse number 10. Hebrews 6, verse 10 in closing. Listen to this great verse. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Amen? Which you have showed toward His, His name that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. He's not, he is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love that you have showed to the saints in your ministry, your ministering, your love, your service. He is not going to forget what you've done. And one day He will reward that. He will honor that. Don't miss out. Trust Him. Believe Him. Amen? Let's stand for prayer. Father, help us. I know so often we're tempted by the flesh, the world, and even Satan, Lord, to look at the problems and the reasons why and to to find it an excuse to quit, to not serve God, to not give our best, to not uh, trust Him not to believe you, Father, your word. And all of that, all of that is sinfulness and selfishness. We pray, God, that you'd help us to have the faith of Abraham or help us to focus again on the, what you have said and your word, your promises. And help us, Lord, to uh, hold on to the truth that we find in the word of God and to live a life of confidence and trust in you knowing, God, that you have never lied. You've never broken your word. You've always done exactly what you said you would do. Father, in this invitation, I pray you'd help those that are struggling, 
or those that are unsaved, help them that they might come to Christ this morning and just believe the gospel and believe Christ and put their faith and trust in you for salvation. And Father, help those Christians that are serving and they're struggling in that service and they wonder, is it worth it? Am I making a difference at all? Help them to come and realize that they're serving the Christ, the Savior. Lord, help them to see that you can work an amazing work and you're doing a tremendous thing in their life and help them, God, just to be faithful to you, trust you with the outcome, the results. Lord, help them just to give their life to labor for you and for your cause and for your kingdom. God, help those that are suffering. Lord, help them to come and kneel this altar and say, Lord, help me. Lord, I want to abide in the and the fiery trial, Lord, so that it could perform its work. I know there'll be a day that this trial will be over, and I want the dross burn out. I want to have that patience, that joyful endurance that you're developing in me. And, and God, I just have all confidence that you're with me in this suffering and that you'll show me the way. Help those that have needs this morning to come to Christ and say, Lord, meet this need. Show yourself strong. Lord, please hear our cries and answer our pleas and help our church. And God, meet the needs today in Jesus' name. Amen. Brenda, what page? Page 505. 505, you need to come for prayer. Would you please come? Let the Lord... uh...